Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming to our Polariton Chemistry webinar. And today we have our special event, Puzzle Spotlight. So we're going to have these two talented puzzles giving us uh, 30, each, 30 minutes talks each uh, about Polariton research. Uh, but before we start with the presentations, let me just uh, give you some brief introduction about the mechanics of the webinar. Uh, first of all, this is the calendar for uh, the next uh, month. So we're going to have Professor Gina George next week. Then we're going to have Professor Jonathan Foley, <coughs> Professor Angel Ruby, and Professor Henry Koch. Uh, if you want to have more details about the webinars and when the webinars are going to be, uh, please follow us on our social media, on our Facebook group, uh, Polariton Chemistry Online Community. Uh, you're allowed not only to post things related to the webinar, but also to post things uh, about anything that can be important for the Polariton chemistry community, like past uh, positions and stuff like that. Uh, if you cannot make it to the webinar due to the time zone, then uh, you can also watch the videos on our YouTube channel, Polariton Chemistry Webinars. And about the mechanics of this webinar, because the talks are going to be only 30 minutes this time. And we're only going to allow questions on the, at the end of each presentation. So if you have any question, I, I, I ask you please to wait until the end of the presentation. Then you raise your hand. And then I'll let you ask the question to the speaker. If you have also another question, you can also write in the Q&A chat. Um, and with the mechanics being clear, uh, let me introduce you the first speaker for today's webinar, which is uh, Dr. Bin Liu who's gonna talk about the role of long-lived excitons in the dynamics of strongly coupled molecular systems. And Professor Bin Lee received his PhD uh, from Case Western uh, Reserve University in 2018. And he's been working as a postdoc research associate at the Uni City University of New York since then, mainly studying photo modification of photophysical properties of organic materials and energy transfer with strong coupling in optical cavities and nanostructures. He's been working uh, with Professor uh, Vinad Menon. So uh, thank you, Dr. Bin Lee, and you can share your screen now. Okay, yeah, thank you for your introduction. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, so yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bin Liu. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, co-advised by Professor Menun and Professor Sphere at City uh, University of New York. And I really appreciate I have this opportunity uh, to present some of our results. And uh, today I will, you know, mainly talk about the role of long-lived exciton in the dynamics of uh, organic polariton systems. Uh, if I have enough time left, I will, you know, talk more, you know, some new results in our recent paper. All right, so. Um, okay, so I believe uh, most of you are very, you know, familiar with uh, uh, cavity polar polaritons. And uh, as you know, the polariton, you know, which are hybrid light matter credit particles, uh, result from the strong coupling between some material uh, excitation uh, transitions, for example, exciton in semiconductors, and also uh, with uh, the uh, uh, resonant mode, for example, photons. So for the uh, optical, for the resonators, it can be, you know, the Fabry-Pro cavity, cavity resonator. It can also be some, you know, propagating surface plasma polariton systems. And also it can be some, you know, surface lattice resonance. Uh, for the material side, it can be inorganic or organic materials. And the strong coupling can be characterized by this kind of uh, uh, anti-crossing dispersion relations and the unique properties from the exotonic and photonic components of polaritons can help realize some you know, very fascinating uh, phenomenon and uh, applications. For example, uh, polariton lasing, uh, long range energy transfer, uh, the enhancement of nonlinear optical response, and polariton LED devices, and also the uh, chemical uh, modif modifications. So uh, for organic exciton polaritons, there are some challenges and issues. Uh, first might be due to the uh, vibrational modes. And also we know for organic materials, in order to realize strong coupling, a large number of organic molecules have to be used. And uh, besides polariton, a large density of uh, 
uh, degenerate uh, incoherent uh, states can also be formed, which is called dark states. And together with the uncoupled uh, molecules, uh, all these can give us the axon reservoir. So the axon reservoir, you know, usually play a very important role in the dynamics of uh, organic platform systems. So meanwhile, you know, the organic spin conversion materials are widely used uh, for uh, optical electronic applications. And uh, recently, these kind of materials is also, are also studied in the strong coupling regime. So for example, in this study, the intersystem crossing materials uh, is used in strong coupling and people try to study if the reversed intersystem crossing rate can be modified to use a strong coupling. And it turns out they uh, didn't find any modification due to the presence of the uh, uh, large density of dark states. And another you know, typical uh, type of uh, spin conversion material is single fission molecules. So a single fission uh, precise is a precise, you know, where the single exciton can convert into uh, triplet pair states. And then this pair, this pair of triplet states can be phased and become individual triplet states. So people use a uh, single fission molecule in a strong company regime and the, the observed uh, and enhanced uh, and delayed uh, photoluminescence. And they uh, explained this was due to an exponential uh, relaxation channel between the dark triplet states and the lower platform states. So while all of these study were performed using a time-resolved uh, photoluminescence measurement and with very uh, low uh, time resolution. So it makes the uh, transient optical uh, technique more desirable in order to study the uh, dynamics of the strongly coupled system because it could provide very important information for the early time dynamics with a very high time resolution. And also we can you know, directly study the dynamics of the uh, non-emissive triplet states. So the uh, single efficient molecule we studied is a, a derivative of patching. It is a model uh, spin conversion materials which can provide a set of uh, axitonic states, for example, singlet, triplet, triplet pair states. And also it can provide, you know, critical, different critical decay time scales, which can uh, span from five to, to microseconds. And uh, so this is absorption and uh, emission spectra for a uh, tape's path thing uh, mixed with the polymer film. And uh, we study a uh, fiber pro cavity with a low Q factor. And for comparison, we also study a half cavity for the control. All right, so first we, uh, we use the uh, angle resolved reflectivity measurements and angle resolved emission measurements to characterize the strong coupling. And uh, we found the Rabi splitting from our system is around 110 MeV, which is larger than any loss from the individual components of the platform space. And next we performed the uh, transient optical measurement uh, with the uh, control sample first. So actually this is a very typical transient optical, uh, transient data set from this kind of uh, singlet fission molecules. And where you can clearly see the singlet and triplet states at a specific wavelength under a certain time window. And in order to analyze the data to you know, extract the decay, uh, decay rate, um, we use standard uh, procedures uh, to analyze the data. So I will, not go, I will not go into the details, but just to let you know, first we use a singular value of decomposition in order to find out the number of the linearly independent components, which gives you the number of the distinct species in the axitonic dynamics. So it turns out we uh, find the two ensembles of a singlet axiton, which can undergo singlet fission precise. And next, we use a sequential decay, a kinetic model to fit the experimental data. So from this kind of analysis, first, we can find out the uh, uh, characteristic uh, spectra corresponding to each step in the sequential model. And also, we can find out the decay rate constants for each step. And here, I would like to point out if you look at the uh, um, spectral feature around 508, so where the uh, triplet state is dominant, where you can see from a step one to step three, you can see the, uh, the amplitude 
uh, you know, keep increasing. Then when you go to step four, you can see the it will reduce. So that that corresponds to the decay of the triplet states. At the very beginning, at the, for the first three steps, the triplet states will be populate, and and then uh, for the step four, the triplet you know states will decay. All right. So uh, next, we performed the transient optical measurement uh, for the strongly coupled cavities, and uh, so first we just use a probe without any pump to locate the polyaton states. And then we turn on the pump. We use different wavelengths to pump the system. So the wavelengths can be resonant with the upper, lower polyaton, can also be uh, you know, uh, resonant with the vibronic sideband of the exciton. So actually the transient optical data looks very similar, no matter what kind of wavelength we use to pump the system. So this is the uh, experimental data. So here I would like to uh, point out some you know, key features. First, you can see you know, some you know, spectral uh, derivative feature around the polyaton states. And also this kind of a feature can persist over a very long time scales. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the you know, uh, key features from the transient data. And then we uh, use the same procedures uh, to analyze the data and uh, to find out the decay, uh, uh, decay rate constants for the uh, uh, couple, strongly coupled cavity. And uh, by using this kind of uh, decay rate constants, actually we can reconstruct the data. So these are the simulation results where you can see a good agreement between the experimental and the simulation results. And uh, then we can compare the decay rate constant with those values from the uncoupled cavity, uncoupled uh, system. So there's no, almost no significant change you know, for this decay rate constant. So which means it looks like in the strongly coupled system, you know, the dynamics looks very similar as those in the uncoupled system. Okay, so then we try to understand, you know, what's the region of the transient response in the strongly coupled uh, system. So first we can compare the uh, characteristic spectra corresponding to each step in the sequential model we used. So on the left, that's the, uh, the spectra for the half cavity I already mentioned. And on the right, that's the uh, spectra for the uh, strongly coupled cavity, uh, where you can see the amplitude evolution uh, you know, around the polyaton states actually behaves very similarly compared to the uncoupled molecules. So from here, it gives an, you know, another you know, kind of evidence like uh, in the strongly uh, coupled system, the dynamics is kind of dominant by the, uh, the exciton. Okay, so, but we need, you know, uh, in order to verify this point further, uh, we consider more factors. So first we consider if there is any, uh, if there is any um, pump induced saturation effect on the density uh, saturation, uh, on the density, on the axon density. So if that was the case, there should be some uh, Rabbit splitting, uh, there should be some uh, dependence or Rabbit splitting on time and on pump fluence but we didn't find this kind of dependence. And actually we, uh, estimate, we estimate the uh, reduction of the Rabbit splitting uh, due to the change of the uh, number of the molecules. And you, where you can see that the, the change of the Rabbit uh, splitting is pretty small because our Rabbit splitting is about 110 MeV. So the change is around one MeV, uh, which means you know, there is only a very small modification in wavelength, maybe less than 0.5 nanometer. So actually we cannot resolve this kind of a tiny difference using our setup because our setup has a very high time resolution, not a very high you know, spectral resolution. So we couldn't see any reduction of the Rabbit splitting, even you know, uh, we keep increasing the pump fluence before uh, you know, we damage the sample. Okay, so it looks like this is not a case. Then we uh, consider the, uh, the pump induced uh, modification of index refraction of the organic materials. So because for the uh, control sample, we already know the information uh, due, to the, uh, due to the pump. And uh, 
actually we can get the uh, the change of the uh, absorption coefficients, which is the imaginary part of the index refraction. And then we can use uh, Kramer's chronic relations to derive the real part. So once we have this kind of information, we can you know, uh, calculate the reflectivity uh, for our cavity samples. And uh, so we can calculate uh, the uh, reflectivity with a regional index refraction of the material. We can also you know, calculate uh, the modified reflectivity uh, with the modified index refraction of the material. Finally, we can get the differential reflection. So that's what we did. And uh, now I would like to compare the uh, results uh, for the, you know, between the, uh, the spectra from the sequential model and uh, with the uh, calculation results by the transfer matrix methods. So where you can see the calculation results from the transfer matrix method almost reproduce all the features. And uh, you know, for example, the derivative uh, spectral feature and even the, it can, they can also reproduce the amplitude evolution uh, around the platform states. So which means, okay, so which means uh, the, the transient response from the strongly coupled system, you know, is due to the pump induced uh, modification or index refraction of the material. And uh, so there is no real population evolution of the platforms but it, uh, so this kind of uh, transient response, you know, just reflect the dynamics of the exciton. So actually there, you know, we can provide more evidence for this kind of conclusion. So we performed the ultra fast uh, time resolved uh, PL measurements. And uh, so, so in the, the left figure, the left graph shows us the, uh, the spectra of the uh, coupled cavity. Um, the, the PL spectra of the coupled cavity under different uh, collection angles at a delay time around five picoseconds. So remember, so this time, this delay time is pretty is much longer than the intrinsic lifetime of the exciton cavity platform. But we can still see this kind of long-lived uh, emission spectral shifts, and also we can you know derive the, the emission decay rate. Uh, from you know for the uh, for the um, emission peak for each emission peak wavelength, and uh, actually there's no angle uh, depend angle there's no angle dependent uh, decay rate. So we know you know if it's a intrinsic platonic effect. So this kind of decay rate should be uh, depend on the angle. So actually there are already some reference paper you know they mentioned that due to the external reservoir. The emission, you know, uh, shows you know uh, angle independent behavior. So, which is also the uh, exciton reservoir plays a very important role in the emission. And also, we can compare this uh, decay rate with the single fission uh, rate, uh, which is very similar. So, the point is, once we know, when we measure the ultra fast time result PL, we are measuring the total decay rate. Uh, actually, there are two decay, uh, relaxation uh, precise for the singulate exciton. One is a singulate uh, fission precise. The other one is uh, the scattering from the singulate to lower platform. Uh, so from this measurement, actually we are measuring the uh, total decay rate. But it turns out the measured decay rate is very similar to the singulate fission rate. So which means this K, this decay rate, it should be pretty small. This implies, you know, there is only very weak uh, scattering between the uh, uh, singulate uh, exciton to the uh, lower platon states. All right, so, so again, this shows us the, uh, uh, you know, in the, even in the strongly coupled uh, system, the dynamics of the, uh, the dynamics of the system is dominant by the, uh, the uh, long-lived exciton reservoir states. All right, to, uh, to, summarize, to summarize. So first, you know, as I mentioned several times, the dynamics of the strongly coupled system is determined by the long-lived exciton reservoir. And uh, I mean, for the half cavity, we do find the real population 
uh, we do find the real population evolution um, re relating to the singlet and the triplet states. And but for the strongly coupled cavity, there's no real population of the long-lived polyaroton states. And all of these feature, you know, is due to the uh, the molecule due to the exciton reservoir. And uh, but uh, these uh, spectral these transient response from the strongly coupled cavities can be used as a very sensitive probe for the non-equilibrium uh, system. Okay, so also, you know, due to the weak interaction between the weak, uh, between the polyaretons and the external reservoir, you know, it will limit the modification of the dynamics in the strongly coupled system. So based on these uh, conclusion, so it may provide some new directions. For example, you know, maybe the single, it, sing, uh, the single molecule strong coupling uh, um, you know, can provide some you know, uh, promising potentials um, because the, as we know, you know, the dark state should be, has you know, very, uh, uh, very small density of states. And also uh, an, another thing is, you know, um, we can try to make the Rabbit splitting you know, bigger and uh, in order to make sure, in order to make the, the spectral overlap between polyaroton and the exciton as small as possible, and because if you look at uh, most of the uh, uh, organic uh, polyaroton system, usually the, uh, polar the organic material has a very broad absorption. And usually there is a very large overlap between the polyaroton states and the exciton uh, absorption. So by increasing the Rabbit splitting, it may help you know, to find some you know, pure polyarotonic effect. Okay, so, and actually I prepare, also prepared you know, part two and uh, because in our recent work, we, uh, we, you know, we, we, uh, we studied the ultra fast uh, thermal modification of a strong coupling in the same uh, polyaroton system. I will not go into too many details, just let you know, uh, we use IR you know, wavelengths to pump the same um, polyaroton system. And we find a very interesting behavior. So first, uh, you know, at very short time scale, there is a very fast you know, decay um, the key behavior. And then for longer time scale, we find oscillation. So everything can be explained by the electron phonon coupling in the metal film, because you know, there's no signal uh, from the organic material. So any, any um, transient response is due to the, uh, uh, due to the, is from the metal material. And uh, they, are, they, are, uh, they are do you know, have uh, several paper you know, uh, in the strong coupling regime talking about a strong coupling between organic material with a plasmonic nanostructure. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time to show this kind of behavior, behaviors in the cavity of the system. All right, I think uh, that's it. And uh, I will stop here and I'm glad to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bin Li. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, Professor Ross Denman. Um, no, it's... Oh, yes, yeah, Professor Hoyle. Okay, sorry. Do <laughs> uh, you... Wait, I don't... Can, can I talk or should, do you want me to wait? Mm, no, I think... I think you can talk. Yeah, I think okay. you can talk. Uh, hi, Bin. I find hi. this talk really interesting. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, what is the shortest waiting time that you can uh, prove in your singlet fission experiment? So it's limited by the pulse duration. I will see it around 80 femtoseconds. That's okay. due to the pulse duration. So then at 80 femtoseconds, uh, there should be very little uh, population in the reservoir states. Uh, do you see drastically different qualitative features in the pump probe spectrum compared to later times? Uh, no, we didn't, no. You see very similar. You see very similar patterns. You never see the rabi contractions due to rabi, sp rabi splitting contractions ever. No, no, we didn't. Uh, we, yeah, we know we didn't. So uh, yeah, actually, yeah, we can we check the we check the uh, different time scales. Uh, we check the you know uh, pump fluence, uh -huh. and uh, we can we cannot see any reduction of the rabi splitting. And I think it's different from the open cavity case. 
for open Wait, cavity. Can you explain the open cavity versus closed cavity again? Can you show those two? Uh, I'm a bit confused about what you mean by open cavity. Okay, okay. so open cavity like a plasmonic uh, uh -huh. uh, nanostructure. Uh -huh. right? So they pump the molecule directly. Uh -huh. And they can find, you know, once they keep increasing the pump influence, the rubber splitting, you know, will, will close. Yes. But in our case, we didn't. And uh, we believe, you know, first of all, you can see the rubber splitting, the change of rubber splitting is pretty small. I think, uh, you know, it's limited by the spectral resolution. And also uh, for the plasmonic cavity, due to the, uh, uh, you know, large uh, uh, enhancement uh, of the field in the local area, it's, it might be easier to see the, this kind of change. I see. I, I, I believe the, the Skulls group in Princeton also did yeah. never saw the rubber splitting contraction. Yes, uh, yeah, I remember. Also, uh, I, I also they, uh, they also mentioned they find some oscillation behavior. I'm not sure if you remember. Actually, we also you know, see this kind of oscillation. It yes. relates to the, uh, uh, the metal mirror. Okay. So Thank yeah, you. this is a kind of well studied for the, the plasmonic nanostructure. And uh, but you know we first time shows these kind of stuff you know uh, for the cavity platform system. Thank you very uh, much. Okay, we also have Professor Jeff Ruski and Professor Bill Barnes. Does that mean I go first? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I mean. Uh, thanks a lot for a very interesting talk. Um, I had a couple questions. I guess one I will ask is in terms of seeing the. Um, coherent oscillations, as you say, people have seen this in plasmonic systems. And I think there are also reports of people seeing modified electron phonon coupling due to cavities. Do you have any evidence for that? Uh, so, okay. So actually for the wire, so actually in this picture, this is a very long time scale. Actually, if we zoom in for a short time scale, and we do see this kind of a huge change, which happens within the, you know, maybe around 1.5 picosecond. And the way in order to explain and understand this kind of behavior, we introduced, you know, the, actually we just uh, uh, checked the reference paper and uh, using the electron phonon coupling, like, uh, you know, basically the uh, electron temperature and phonon temperature can, you know, uh, vary due to the pump fluence. And uh, due to the electron phonon coupling, actually, you know, we can reproduce this kind of feature. But we didn't study like if this kind of, uh, uh, coupling, electron phonon coupling can be modified by the cavity or not. We didn't do this study. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Mm, now, Professor Bill Barnes. Uh, yes, Ben, thank you. Very nice talk. Actually, Jeff just asked my question, so uh, I, I got my answer already. So thank you. But oh, very nice okay. Talk. So if there is no more questions, I thank you again, uh, Dr. Bin Liu. And and now we go uh, back to Dr. Rui de Silva. Uh, so let me just int briefly introduce uh, Dr. Rui de Silva. He is a theoretical physicist specialized in the behavior of matter under optical excitation in the strong field regime. He graduated uh, from University of Porto in 2010. He did his bachelor in science and he pursued his master's in science in theoretical and computational chemistry at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in Spain. And then at the same uh, university, he began his PhD to work in studying the atomic molecules under intense laser pulses, uh, specializing in quantum dynamic simulation of systems subject to strong electric field excitations. And after his PhD, uh, he moved to Max Born Institute uh, in Berlin to work with Professor Mikhail Ivanovs. Uh, studying high harmonic generation in solid state targets. Uh, finally, in 2018, he integrated the uh, M.M. Mussolini's group led by Johannes Feist to start studying ultrafast molecular uh, polaritonics. Uh, so uh, welcome and thank you uh, for accepting our invitation, uh, Dr. Ray de Silva, you can share your screen. Uh, we, uh, I think there's another issue because uh, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I, I was muted myself. Um, thanks for the introduction, Juan. Um, do you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Okay. So I would like just to say a, a word to the to the YOL group for this nice, nice uh, initiative of these webinars. They are very 
fundamental for the community in these in these pandemic times. Uh, so I'm going to talk about polytonic molecular clock. So a new route that we we propose to observe ultrafast molecular dynamics. Uh, I'm Rui Silva and I work at the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid at the group of uh, M muscles led by Johannes Feist. And this this work was published in in this reference. Okay. Um, so first of all, a, a bit of introduction. Um, we can we all know that light matter interaction can allow us to understand uh, and control also matter properties, and we have fundamentally two ways to do this. Uh, on, on one side, we have lasers or strong lasers in which we we, we shine our sample uh, with many coherent photons. And in that way, with, with, with strong electric fields, we can really change the, the potential felt by the, the electrons in atoms or, or in molecules. And we can control and also understand the dynamics of, of, of electrons and also uh, nuclei. Uh, another approach that is the approach that we take in, in molecular polytonics is the cavity QED, in which we enhance, instead of using many coherent photons, we enhance the, the, the interaction between the molecule and a, 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 a photonic, a single photonic mode. So by we, we can control matter properties with using a single photon. So the usual approach to, to understand the uh, ultrafast dynamics in molecules, so this, this whole field can be called femtochemistry. So it's the field of studying uh, the ultrafast in the, in the femtosecond time scale, the ultrafast dynamics of molecules and also try to change and, and, and to change the molecular reactivity in an ultrafast scale. Uh, and I'm going to briefly summarize because this is the goal of my talk is to propose a new uh, route towards femtochemistry. So the usual approach is to, uh, you have your molecule, you have your reaction coordinate, your nuclear configurations, and then you start with the, the molecule initially at the ground state, you shine your molecule with a strong pump and this pump can be resonant with some electronic state, will uh, give uh, rise to, um, will launch a nuclear wave packet in excited electronic states. After some, some time, uh, this, this nuclear wave packet will now evolve in the, in the electronic uh, potential energy surface, the, the excited electronic, and, uh, and we will see some um, wave packet motion, okay? Now to, the approach of femtochemistry is now to come with a, with a synchronized propulse that has a given delay with respect to the pump. And this pro propulse can um, either ionize or dissociate our molecule. And by, by analyzing the fragments that originate by this propulse, we can infer what was the position and the spread of our nuclear wave packet in the electronic states. And uh, so, our proposal now is, can we use molecular strong coupling to engineer a scheme without the need of a propulse? So can we eliminate this second part of, of, the, of, the, of the process? This, this part of the process is, can, has some cons. One of the cons is that you simply destroy uh, your, your molecule because you either ionize or dissociate. And can we have a more direct fingerprint of the molecular dynamics? So uh, to, 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 to briefly introduce uh, our theoretical framework, we just start as always with the James Cummings in which we have uh, an exciton mode and a cavity photon mode. And this cavity photon can be a fabry uh, or a plasmonic uh, nanocavity. And when they are in resonance and they are strongly coupled, you, you end up with two states that are called the polariton, the lower polariton and the upper polariton states. And of course, we all know that these, these are separated by the Rabi frequency, that is two times the, the interaction strength between them. And the interaction strength scales with the transition dipole moment and the single uh, electric uh, field, single photon electric field that goes with the inverse of the square root of the volume mode. mode. Um, when, when depending on, on the losses of our system, uh, we can have a weak or strong coupling if since we, our system is not, uh, is not a closed system, our cavity can, can have losses, also our molecule, we need to take into account these losses. And if the Rabi splitting is much smaller than the typical losses, we are in the weak coupling regime. So we have 
small parcel effect. So we, we can modify the radiative decay of the molecule. On the other hand, if the Rabi splitting is much larger than the losses in our system, we are in the strong coupling regime. Then we have these polaritons and we have coherent energy exchange between the molecule, uh, the exciton mode and the cavity photon mode. So we are going to treat a, a molecule and we are going to use uh, for the beginning a toy model and we are going to use the displaced harmonic oscillator in which our, our two potentials are just considered to be parabolas uh, and our ground state and, and excited state are just displaced in, in the nuclear configuration and also in, in energy. And uh, this is the, the form of the Hamiltonian and then we can include this exciton phonon coupling and we are going to treat the, the anthracene molecule. So here I'm showing anthracene and this is the spectral density of the anthracene and at the beginning, since anthracene, we are going just to treat a single vibrational mode. We are going to take this reaction coordinate that is uh, around here. So anthracene is, is a molecule with uh, a very pro predominant uh, uh, mode, vibrational mode. So this is going to help us to, to, to really describe. So our anthracene can be, at least in the few femtosecond time scale, can be described by, by a single vibrational mode. So as, as full tonic, uh, mode, we are going to uh, simulate a plasmonic nanocavity. cavity. Uh, so uh, a plasmon is just a collective excitation of electrons in a mo mo metal. And we can confine by, by using, for example, this, 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 this setup uh, used by Bamberg in, 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 in its paper on single molecule strong coupling. We can confine a molecule in a very, very small, tiny amount uh, volume and we can make this, this G, this, this coupling very strong. So on the other hand, since we have an open cavity, we, we have a very lossy uh, photonic mode. So these, 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 these photonic losses need to be taken into account. So the plasmonic, when we include everything, what we are going to do is to take in, into, we are going to shine with a laser field our plasmonic mode. And this is the, the term that, that will pump the plasmonic mode. And uh, then this is the, the standard uh, Olstein Tavis Cummings model. And we are going to take the, 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 into account the losses of the plasmonic mode by just adding a, a limb term. Okay, just a brief, uh, a brief tour of, over polaritonic potential energy surface. The, the way that we are going to understand all of the, all, all of the physics are going to rely heavily on the polaritonic potential energy surface. And to understand it, it's, it's very easy. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we have just, for example, yeah, our ground state, and then we have the, the cavity uh, potential energy surface that is just the ground state displaced by the, the, the photon energy. And then we have our excited uh, electronic state. Uh, if this is, these are the bare uh, curves, if we diagonalize, we end up with new potential energy surfaces that are now the lower polariton energy surface and the upper polariton energy surface. Okay, um, the thing is that now G uh, is, is dependent on, can be dependent on, on, on Q, but more interesting is that the character of our lower polariton and our uh, upper polariton depends on the, the nuclear coordinate. So uh, in strong coupling, this may change drastically the, the, the molecular dynamics. So we, you, you see that also the exit on uh, the, the bare uh, potential energy surface are, are very different from the lower and the upper polarity. So in this way, we can take advantage of this. And this is what the call the field of polaritonic chemistry. And for uh, a particular view, uh, at least uh, the view that we have here in, in, our, in our group, you can look up in, in these two articles about uh, review of polaritonic chemistry, okay. Um, so the polaritonic molecular clock is just this, is, is we are going to shine our molecule, our plasmon um, with a laser field. And if we do that resonantly with the lower polaritonic uh, potential energy surface, we create an ultra short pump pulse that will launch a nuclear rate packet. If we wait, a uh, bit uh, in the femtosecond time scale, this wave packet, of course, is going to evolve. But the nice thing is that the character of our, our nuclear wave packet will change. So we, if we are here, predominantly here, when, when Q is, is smaller than zero, we are predominantly in a cavity, 
dominated uh, uh, re regime. Uh, so, so our our polarity is is more cavity like. And when we are further apart, when Q is is greater than zero, we are mostly uh, uh, we our nuclear wave packet have mostly uh, an excitonic part. So. What will happen is that, uh, of course, we are going to start to, to vibrate in, in this potential. So we are going to back and forth in this potential energy surface. And the only way, since, since our, our cavity is the only leaky, uh, leaky part in our Hamiltonian, the, the, our molecule only have opportunity to decay when it is around this region. So we can probe when our wave packet passes a photon-like re region that is when k is smaller than zero. So I'm going to show you. So the nuclear wave packet in the excited subspace. So what I'm showing here is really. So I shine. Uh, I shine explicitly uh, with a with a laser field, and then this creates a nuclear wave packet here around around zero at, at time. So this is time, and this is the nuclear coordinate. Okay, and what you see. Here is the, 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 the vibrational motion of our nuclear wave packet. And what I'm showing here in blue is the cavity population. So the cavity population is proportional to the light emission uh, of, of our system. So our system only release photons when we have uh, given cavity population. So this is the time dependent emission of our cavity. And what we see is that when if we integrate the, the most photon-like, that is when Q or, or R is smaller than zero, if we integrate this in time, we have the orange curve, okay? And you see that this orange curve follows closely the cavity population. So if we are in an experiment and we look at the time resolved photo emission, we can have a, 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 a direct fingerprint of molecular dynamics in an ultra fast time scale. So in, in a few femtosecond time scale, okay? So we can have an all optical probe of nuclear motion without probe pulses. We have only to shine our, our molecule with a, with a pump. And then by looking at the time result photo emission, we can see uh, directly the, the, the nuclear motion. So what I've done here is is, is a bit different, so um, uh, is a bit different. It's the same, but now I'm going to, to scan over the, um, the laser frequency. So in the vertical axis, I just scan over the, um, over the laser frequency. And I, here, for example, I'm, I'm uh, resonant uh, with the lower polariton, and here I'm resonant with the upper polariton. And what you can see is that so this is the cavity population and this is the molecular population and you see that the molecular population uh, is 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 having these modulations and this period is really the period of the the, the classical period of isolation of our lower polarity and uh, potential energy surface so we can really trace back this this oscillation frequency by looking at the time dependent cavity uh, cavity uh, population when we go from strong to weak coupling, so now what we are going to do is going from a very high Rabi splitting to, 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 to small Rabi splitting. And what we see is that these stripes are no longer uh, equally spaced. When, when you change the Rabi splitting, this, this period is going to change. And this is just an effect that the, our potential energy surface are changing when we change the Rabi splitting. So we are really probing the polaritonic potential energy surface, not only the bare, uh, the bare uh, potential energy surface. And in weak coupling, the, 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 the picture that, that we have is a bit different. So in weak coupling, we, we don't change the, the potential energy surface. What we do is just introduce a small, de a, a small decay uh, that is now dependent on Q. So for example, if my cavity is in resonance uh, at, at Q equals zero, what this is going to show is that I'm going to, each time that our, um, our nuclear wave packet passes at, at Q equals zero, you will see a, a flash of light uh, coming out from our plasmonic uh, structure. 
So up to now, I've only talked about a single vibrational mode. So what happens if we include the more vibrational modes? Uh, so in, 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 indeed, we are going to take into account all the vibrational modes uh, of, of the anthracene. So we are going to take into account the, the full spectral density. But of course, we, we end up with, a, with, a, with an Hamiltonian that has a lot of degrees of freedom. So this is too complex for a brute force approach. So our solution is to use tensor networks and or matrix product states. So the idea of matrix product states is that uh, usually a many body uh, Hilbert space is, is so large that you cannot uh, do a brute force approach because there is no computer on earth that can treat uh, more than 20 bosons, okay, with 10 states. So you end up with uh, Avogadro numbers. So it's really impossible, but we have uh, a thing that is called area law. So the, 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 the interesting part of the Hilbert space usually uh, is a very, very tiny part of the many body of the full Hilbert space. And indeed, what we can do is, if you imagine your, your wave function as a tensor for with each index related to a, a given degree of freedom, we can map this big tensor that is unbearable to treat computationally to uh, a local contraction of uh, the contraction of local tensors. So these local tensors are, it, this can be done exactly, but if we truncate this dimension now, uh, we can reduce substantially our, our parameter space. And so this is the basic idea of tensor network is to create a network of tensors that emulate the structure of our Hamiltonian. Uh, we can write then a, a full wave function with, with billions of coefficients as a contraction of many local tensors. So we can do things that are unthinkable on a, on a brute force approach. And to do that, since we have like this, this, this is the kind of Hamiltonian that we have in the exciton phonon coupling. And what we need to do is to, to map this, this, this into a local Hamiltonian. And we do this by a procedure that is called the chain mapping. So in the tensor network, it, um, in the tensor network simulations, we have uh, we, we include explicitly the vibration due phasing, and I'm going here to show you uh, what is the difference between the single mode and the tensor network. So in the tensor network, we really include all the modes. So here in in green, we are pumping to the lower polaritonic. Uh, potential energy surface. And we see that the polaritonic dissociations still survive when we include vibrational dephasing. And also in, in the upper uh, polaritonic potential energy surface is the same. So we can still see, even if we include vibrational dephasing, this effect persists. So the polaritonic microclock still works when we include uh, a lot of vibrational modes. So what about non-harmonic potential? So we have been talking about uh, always a displaced harmonic. So if we try non-harmonic potentials, what will happen? Uh, the first thing is that your now your your classical oscillation time is is going to change depending on on the energy in that we that that you are resonant with the laser pulse. Okay. So here you have. Um, um, a smaller oscillation time than here, for example, in, in an anharmonic potential. And when we look at the, the, the same plots that we were looking that were in the displaced harmonic oscillator, uh, mostly vertical, vertical lines, now we see that you have some dependence on the laser frequency. And this is completely mapped to the classical oscillation time that we can calculate easily uh, classically. And these, these maximums follow this, this formula. So we can uh, have a direct mapping of the classical energy dependent oscillation time. And in principle, we could reconstruct, uh, at least in, in 1D, with these kind of, of, of uh, measurements, we could reconstruct the polaritonic potential energy surface. So what about uh, if we include more molecules. So single molecule strong coupling is very hard to achieve. So the record is, is 80 millivs in, in the paper of, of uh, Baumberg. Uh, and for that, we also have used this tensor network approach. And we have seen that uh, indeed you can, uh, for, see, for few molecules, you still see these, these oscillations. So I'm here I'm pumping to the, um, to the lower polaritonic potential energy surface. And in the HTC, so the full lines are just a single vibrational mode and the dashed lines are 
several vibrational modes. So even when we include several molecules and several vibrations uh, in, in the, the, the full complexity of the vibrational uh, spectrum, we still can see these oscillations that could map the, the ultra-fast molecular dynamics. So yes, and indeed we are seeing the observation of many molecular wave packets moving coherently. So this is kind of um, a nice result if we could do this in an experiment, of course, uh, to, to look at, at a direct uh, measure of um, coherent uh, motion of several molecules at, at a time. So to summarize and to conclude, we have proposed a novel scheme to probe and image molecular dynamics by measuring the time-dependent radiative emission. So we have a direct probe of nuclear motion in the polaritonic potential energy surface with emitted photon signal. And this also works in, in the weak coupling regime measuring the nuclear dependent Purcell factor. And this can provide an alternative route to probe ultra fast molecular dynamics without the need of probe poles. So this could be uh, uh, an approach, uh, a completely new approach to, to femtochemistry. So at the end, I would like to, to, to to acknowledge to, to my collaborators, to Javier Del Pino, that is now at Netherlands, to FJ Garcia Vidal, Francisco Garcia Vidal at, at WAM, and also to my postdoc supervisor, Johannes Feist, here at WAM. And also to all of you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rui de Silva. Uh, we do have uh, questions again from uh, Joel and Matt Du. Oh, hello. Uh, 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 this is a very beautiful talk. Uh, I want to ask you a question regarding the Purcell uh, limit case. I don't see why in that case you don't see oscillations uh, because you said every time you reach the cavity region, uh, you emit light. You have yeah. birth. But uh, you don't... It seems that the oscillations are... This is just a matter of resolution, right? Like uh... no, no, yeah, yeah. It, it is a matter of resolution. The thing is that here in this plot, uh, in the weak coupling, what is really dominating is the ring down of the plasmonic cavity. So you, you pump. I'm pumping the, the 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 cavity, and most of the population of the cavity uh, goes down in in few femtoseconds. And then what happens is that the population that 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 was was excited in the molecule, then it will ring down. So we see, we still see oscillations. Uh, the thing is that in this plot, uh, we don't because it's fully dominated by, but here uh, I'm fully showing- Fully dominated you, by what? Uh, by the, 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 the plasmonic decay. Uh, uh -huh. so, so because you just pump at the cavity and then most of the population goes to, directly to the cavity and you have uh, the, the, the decay of, of, the, of the cavity and you can excite a few percentage of, of, of molecules, but it's a tiny population compared to, the, so it's fully dominated at the beginning by the, the, the plasma, okay? But at the, after we remain with, with some excited molecules that will then do this, this, this molecular motion and will flash uh, as soon as you, you cross these, these, these point in, in which your cavity is, is, is in resonance with uh, the exciton. So in both cases, you are both in the weak and in the strong coupling regime, you pump directly the plasmonic nanoparticle. Yeah, yeah. In, in both cases, I'm, I'm because, yeah, that's that's what usually happens. The, 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 the I see. And in, in the polaritonic regime, there is half and half cavity and matter. That's why you see more. Yeah, that, yeah. That yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, and very quickly, uh, in a few slides ago, before this, you show that the photoemission, this one here, the photoemission uh, looks pretty much the same as the photon, but not exactly. Like, is it because the transition dipole moment changes as a function of nuclear coordinate, or what are the, the variations due to? It's just because it's not really, I mean, uh, I'm assuming that uh, the assumption is that uh, for, for R less than zero, smaller than zero, uh, that your 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 polar polariton is mostly dominated by the cavity, but uh, that's not true because in these regions it's not true. Okay, so right. that's only because of that. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe it's not due to the transition. The transition dipole moment stays. No, the, 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 the here, transition right? dipole moment. I, I assume that is constant uh, uh, along the the nuclear coordinate. Okay. 
Thank you very much. So now Matt. Yeah, actually I had this, a very similar question. So it was mostly answered, but I'd like to follow up with the related question. So if instead you, for example, did like somehow pump the exciton part instead of initializing your population in the cavity part, would you, you actually be able to resolve all those oscillations? Or I mean, the thing is that, okay, so, uh, the thing is that, uh, okay, so I, I have my cavity um, and I pump, I, I really scan over, over, the, over the laser frequency. So I'm pumping at the beginning at the lower polarity. And, but for example, if I, if I pump here at this, at this energy, I pump, I'm pumping mostly the excitant. But still, you, you, if you create some, some, some nuclear wave packets, you, you will observe also oscillations. So that's what, what I, I show here. Even when I change the, the the laser frequency, I still see the oscillations. Okay. But I'm saying if like if you go to your next slide where you show the yeah so like at Robbie split equals point like one right or point yeah. oh five right it seems to have a much lower resolution compared to yeah the yeah yeah. Display. So I'm saying That's... if you put all your initial population the exciton first. Ah, okay. Did you but, get but better thing, resolution? Yeah, of course. But the thing is that when, when, when you, yeah, if I, in my model, I would do like, instead of pumping the plasmonic, I would pump at the, the molecule directly. Yeah. Because then I would not see this ring down of the plasmonic. But in reality, when you shine a laser field into a laser pulse into a plasmonic nanocavity, the, the response is mostly dominated by the, the plasmonic nanocavity because it's the, way bigger it has a way bigger dipole moment compared to the to the molecule so that's why realistically we 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 we, we shine uh, or we pump directly into the into the into the plasmonic cavity okay thank you now uh professor agnes b bach and then jim Wu kim uh, thank you for a nice talk uh i'd like to ask about the the coordinate uh, did you consider that the Q as the single molecular uh, vibrational mm -hmm. coordinate? Because, you know, in the polarity polar state, it uh, can be uh, represented as the linear combination of single molecular excited states. So this means the char characteristics of single molecular excited state would be very small for single molecules. In this case, can we think that the Q you wrote at the x-axis as a single molecular vibrational coordinate. Okay, so so when when I do the single vibrational mode, what I'm choosing uh, as the, my my nuclear degree of freedom uh, is the reaction coordinate. So it's really the for few femtoseconds, it's really the the coordinate where most molecular dynamics is going to to follow. But when I include uh, several vibrational modes, I'm including the, the full molecular space and, and, and uh, the effect still survives. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, um, but, but I mean, this depends. Of course, I, I've chosen a molecule that has a very strong um, or a very high um, reorganization energy. Because that's why, uh, that's how you, you, you manage to get these uh, very dependent uh, mm. characters of, of your molecule. If your reorganization energy is very small, of course, these, these, these dependence on, on this character dependence on the molecular coordinate would be much, much smoother. And then you would not see so much effect. So this is also a thing, but but at the same time, you, you can also always go to the weak coupling case. And in weak coupling, you, you can tune your cavity to be in resonance with different parts. And well, uh, but, but you always need to, you have a, yeah, you need to be wise choosing your parameters. So you need to have a very, uh, a very high uh, reorganization energy for that matters. And uh, Professor Agnes Vibok very much. It's a very interesting talk. And uh, 
uh, go back to your first slide. Uh, I, uh, I see this is a model. Uh, so you have, no, sorry, to the potential energy, model potential okay. energy. Okay, okay, sorry, surface. sorry. Okay, so, uh, okay. So this is a model. So you have yeah. two harmonic potential with the same frequency and assuming uh, constant uh, uh, transition dipole moment. Yeah. Okay, I accept there is no non-adiabatic coupling between the electronic and uh, nuclear motion in this case, in this model case. But uh, it is not always true, even in 1D, we show this. But uh, what uh, you showed at the end of or second part of your talk that uh, you studied also in within this model uh, three or four or many molecules yeah. but if you have three or more molecules the effective conical intersection comes into the play so this model will not be valid anymore because you will have a very strong non-adiabatic coupling induced by the cavity between the nuclear and electronic motion so mm -hmm. that's, and then it will be, how to say, uh, disturb I mean, the whole stuff. If because the there will be a very strong, uh, very, very fast population transfer between the states. Okay, uh, I, I, I agree that we have used a simple model, but if the rabbit splitting is, is, is high enough to separate these, these, these two paths in, in uh, this will, Avoid non-adiabatic crossings because they are uh, non-adiabatic couplings because they are they are important when when you have very very tiny differences in energy between the the, the pairs. And I would assume, I mean, of course, it's model dependent. I'm not saying that this will work for any uh, case. Of course, if you have uh, to take into consideration uh, electronic states that are close by conical intersections, but at least for the reaction coordinate uh, or this approach, if you have a, a very high um, reorganization energy and your rabbit splitting is, is high enough, then you, you would be fine and you would avoid non adiabatic couplings, I, I assume. You cannot, it, you cannot avoid this because you will have a, a stronger uh, uh, collective uh, conical intersection. I mean, but, but, but when, when you have uh, several molecules, your... Yes, three and more. Okay, uh, but, but the thing is that, uh, if, imagine that you have no adiabatic couplings for the single molecule case, you have uh, electronic states Okay, I, I, I accept that there is no, uh, in, in your model, I accept it's okay, it's fine, there is no non-adiabatic coupling. But if you go three and for more molecules, there is an effective conical intersection. You cited the paper uh, with Johannes uh, 2018 in the uh, photonics. And then you showed, he showed that there is a strong uh, effective conical intersection. And I understand yeah, yeah, but, it's fine. So it's a coupling yeah, but induced the by that, the cavity. But we are here very close to the equilibrium. So if we avoid the regions of, of molecular configuration that, 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 that have conical intersections, we don't study at all conical intersections, but, but if we uh, just avoid this part of the configuration space, and if we are fine with it, uh, I would not see any reason for not work for, for many molecules. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe just a quick follow up, just a uh, question I have just following this discussion. So do you think you can use uh, something similar to what you're using right here to study wave packet dynamics to study some effects of conical intersections in molecular systems? I think in principle, yes, uh, I would say so. But, but the thing is that you would need to, to think on what is the more involved uh, dynamics because here the dynamics are very clear and simple um but but the, the the main idea is that you have a, a nuclear wave packet that travels around uh, the the configuration space of the molecule and now this potential energy surface is depend the, the character is dependent on this on this coordinate on this molecular coordinate and when i'm in a in a in a in a configuration space where where my cavity is dominant i'm going to decay and uh, and that's the idea. So in principle, you can study also 
dynamics around conical intersections? I would say so, but you will need to think more more carefully on on these complex dynamics around, uh, or you need to take into account explicitly non-adiabatic couplings. But but that was not the point. The point was just to illustrate the idea, not. Uh, our intention was not to go full onto ab initio uh, with transition dipole moments that really depend, that are, or with realistic. Our idea was to show and propose an idea with a toy model. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. A very nice talk. And uh, if I can share my screen now, let me okay. just uh, let you know uh, that next week we have. Uh, Professor uh, Gino Jar from Indian Institute of Science. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about controlling chemical reactions through uh, cooperative vibrational strong coupling. So please don't miss uh, next week's Polaritan Chemistry webinar. And thank you very much again to Dr. Rui De Silva and Dr. Bing Liu and all Thanks. those who came to the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thanks.